Okay, so in this video, we will consider an example of a chi-squared test of independence. So here's the following problem. In a manufacturing plant, three shifts produce window frames. Three kinds of defects are known to occur during the manufacturing process. 163 defective frames are assessed and classified by shift and defect type. So the two variables here are defect type. We're seeing there are three types of defect. So we will say defect type A, B, C, and there are three shifts, therefore shift 1, 2, 3. So the variables are defect type and shift, and they both are broken down into three categories. Type A, B, C for the defect, shift 1, 2, 3. So for example, look at this number. In shift number 2, there were 15 defective windows, defective frames, that were of defect type B. 14 defective windows were of type C that occurred during shift 2 and so forth. The question is, test at the 1% level of significance the claim that the defect type and the shift are independent. So the question is quite simply, are the two variables, the defect type and the shift during which it occurs, are these two dependent or independent? Let's see. As always, we state our two hypotheses. We will be under the assumption of H0. And remember that when we have a test of independence, we will always be assuming independence. So here, I'll be a little lazy. I'll simply write the variables are independent. What you would write would be defect type and shift are independent. And of course H1 will be that the variables are not independent, or again if you prefer, are simply dependent. We have our significance level of 1%. And so to construct our statistic, to evaluate the value, we need for each observed value of our table, the corresponding expected value. And if you remember, we needed to find those values, the row total and the column total for each row and each column. So let's just rewrite this table, but give ourselves a bit more space. So we had defect type ABC, and we had shifts 1 through 3. And we will need for each row in each column, the total in the row and the column. Well, let's divide up each cell into the observed values and the expected values. I will write the observed on top, the expected value under each not below. and those values will be our total. And you'll see that once we have this table, we will be essentially done. So if you remember, if I just recopy the observed values here in our larger table, for the first row, the values were 12, 28, 17, for the second row, they were 23, 15, 14. For the third row, they were 30, 15, and 9. 
Let's add our row totals and column totals. The first row, 12 plus 28 plus 17, 57. The second row, 23 plus 15 plus 14, 52. And the third row, 30 plus 15, 45, plus 9, 54. And we have a grand total of 150 plus 13, so 163, as was claimed. This is our total sample size. This is our uppercase N. We observed 163 window frames. We also need our column totals. So let's add those up. So 12 plus 23 plus 30 is 65. 30 plus 28, 58. 17 plus 14, 31 plus 9 is 40. And double check here that the total of the columns is also the same as the total of the rows. So you get 123 plus 40, 163. So far so good. And if you want to label this as row or R1, the total of row 1. This is R2, the total of row 2. This is R3, the total of row 3. And similarly, the value here is C1, the total of column 1, this is C2, total of column 2, and this is C3, the total of column 3. Well, now we can find for each cell the expected value. Let me remind you that for the entry in row I column J, the expected value is simply the row total so R i times the column total C j over the entire sample size. Since we have all of our row totals and column totals, we're good to go. So this is E11. It will be 57 times 65 over 163. If you round up to the, say, second decimal place, you'll find 22.73. Let's keep going. Let's find the other expected value. This is now E12, first row, second column. So this will be 57 times 58 over 163. Running up to the second decimal place, we'll find roughly 20.28. And let's keep going. E13, first row, third column, is 57 times 40 over 163. This will be approximately 13.99. Now we have the expected values for the first row. Let's keep going. Here, 52 times 65 over 163. This will give you approximately 20.74. 52 times 58 over 163, roughly 18.50. 52 times 40 over 163, approximately 12.76. Third row, 54 times 65 over 163, approximately 21.53. 54 times 58 over 163, approximately 19.21. And finally, 54 times 40 over 163, approximately 13.25. And now we have in each cell of our table, the observed value and the expected value. We can now compute our observed value of chi-squared. If you recall our statistic, One, one last observation, and that is, how do we know if we have a good enough approximation for the chi-square distribution? The requirement is that in each cell, the expected value under H0 is at least as big as 5. This will guarantee that you have a large enough sample, so you'll have a close enough approximation to the chi-square distribution. And if you look, every value is well above 5, and so we will get a good enough approximation. 
And if you remember, that the sum over each cell of our table, so over every row and every column, we had the observed value minus the expected value squared over the expected value. So always be really careful here. It doesn't matter if you switch O and E here, because since you square the difference, the negative will simply cancel out. But you have to divide by E and not by O. So be really careful. Let me just write out the first term and the last term. The first term, if you go one row at a time, say, would be the observed value 12 minus the expected value 22. 0.73 squared over 22.73 plus, and you keep going, 28 minus 20.28 squared divided by 20.28 plus, and for each cell until you reach the last one, and finally the observed value 9 minus the expected value 13.25 squared divided by, again, the expected value, 13.25. So if you add up the nine values, you will find approximately an observed value of chi-squared of 15.30. The only question remaining is, how big is this? Well, to determine the relative size of our observed chi-squared value, we have to construct our rejection region. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention here is, of course, our degrees of freedom. If you remember, and I'll write it here, the degrees of freedom were m minus 1 times n minus 1. Well, m is the number of rows of our table, and be very careful here not to include the totals, right? M is simply the number of rows, but that's the number of categories of this variable. There were three shifts, and so there are three categories, so M is equal to three. N was the number of columns, and again, we don't include the totals. There were three defect types, type A, B, C, so there are really three columns. And so n is also equal to 3. And so finally, well, 3 minus 1 is 2, times 3 minus 1 is 2. So we get 2 times 2, which is simply 4 degrees of freedom. We have our degrees of freedom, 4. We have our significance level of 1%. We cannot construct our rejection region, given that we have a chi-squared random variable. So we draw a chi-squared random variable, or I should say the distribution, sorry. Since we have four degrees of freedom, the distribution looks something like this. And as always, when you have a test of independence, we always reject the right tail of our distribution, because the right tail means that we have a large chi-squared value and so the predicted value under H0 are far from the observed value, which goes against independence. So we have to reject the right tail. Since we add a significance level of 1%, we only reject the larger 1% of chi-squared value, and we had 4 degrees of freedom. So if you use your table of the chi-squared distribution, you will find that with an area to the right of the chi-squared value of 1% and 4 degrees of freedom, a corresponding chi-squared value of 13.28. And so we now have our rejection region. It goes from 13.28 all the way up to positive infinity, and so this interval contains the larger 1% of chi-squared values. Well, let's remember that our observed chi-squared 
was approximately 15.30. Well, 15.30 is greater than 13.28, and so this observed value of chi squared does belong to our rejection region. So the value is too large, therefore this goes against H0, and so we reject it. On average, the observed values are too far from the predicted values under independence, and so we reject the claim that the variables are independent, therefore we accept that they are indeed dependent. So the defect type of a window frame seems to depend on which shift it was produced, and that is our conclusion. So in the end we would simply say that we accept H1, the conclusion that defect type and shift are really dependent variables. And that's how you do a test of independence with the help of the chi-squared random variable.